instead of doing a slideshow, I thought we would just uh, flip through the document that we're going to be sending out and, and talk to some of the more interesting points in that. So uh, let's go. Yeah, that was a table of contents. Um, so, you know, we've talked about antennas several times. It's always a, uh, a fairly popular topic. Obviously, it's an important topic for uh, Wi-Fi and how they work. Uh, you know, how uh, you're going to get your network working. Um, and this this guide sort of, you know, uh, takes you through it. So, you know, at first we've got a little section on, on how antennas work. Um, and obviously the first step is, you know, that you send power to the, to the antenna through from the radio in the access point. And that's going to pass through a series of cables and connectors, maybe lightning or esters if it's outdoors. And as it does so, some of that energy is going to be lost. Uh, we'll call that cable loss or cable attenuation. And then the antenna itself with the power that it finally receives does not amplify it. It's, it's a passive device. What it does is it focuses that energy. And it also is going to focus... Uh, and I'll touch on this several times, but not only does it focus the transmitted energy, it focuses the receive side as well. So whatever the pattern is on the transmit side, it's the same on the receive side and vice versa. Uh, something that we will touch on several times. Um, one of the terms that we'll hear a lot um, around antennas and transmitters is decibel, dB or dBm, which is decibel related to one milliwatt. And decibels are a logarithmic scale. So small changes in dB actually result in fairly large changes in power. For instance, a 10 dBm transmitter is 10 milliwatts. A 20 dBm transmitter, 10 dB more, is 100 milliwatts. So big changes there. In fact, every 3 dB is going to double or have the power depending on which direction you're going. And every 6 dB is going to double or have the range. Uh, the last uh, sentence on here for optimum coverage, the recommended cell edge is negative 67 dBm. And you know, I'm not sure that that is not a, uh, a little bit weak these days. As we move to higher and higher modulation rates, more complex coding of the symbols, you need more power to decode those higher data rates. So you may very well not see the full uh, data rates at negative 67. You may need to be looking at negative 63 or negative 64 or something like that to really hit those very high data rates that are available with AC and AX coverage. Um, you know, some of the other terms that we talk about, polarization, that's gonna be the alignment of the electric and magnetic fields that are transmitted. Um, several possibilities on that. Uh, linear and circular are kind of the two main categories. And linear is going to be typically either vertical or horizontal. Uh, and circular will be left or right-hand polarized. Uh, circularly polarized and linearly polarized pay a 3 dB penalty uh, talking to each other. And linearly polarized that are 90 degrees out of phase, horizontal versus vertically, almost won't hear each other. Uh, it's a published spec on some of the nicer antennas what that cross pole rejection is. Um, but uh, for kind of modern Wi-Fi devices, they're pretty polarization insensitive. And that's because most of them are intended to be mobile devices, whether it's a cell phone or a laptop or a handheld scanner. They're going to be used in a lot of different orientations. So they're, they're fairly insensitive to that. Uh, outdoor links are um, point to point, point to multi point links. Those are kind of different. Polarization really matters on those. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had a uh, back 
many years ago, I was installing a point to multi point system and the receive signal strength was about 25 dB lower than what we had calculated, which is a huge difference. It was basically the system didn't work and uh, lots of head scratching. And we eventually discovered the polarization stickers on the antennas were 90 degrees wrong. Uh, so uh, in fact, we were installing the antennas sideways uh, and there, there were our 25 dB. We flipped that around and, and we were back to calculated values. So polarization, especially uh, outside, very important, less so inside. Although if you have a choice, you're probably better off with a vertical polarization as due to the kind of the structures inside of buildings uh, as antennas or as signals are reflected, they tend to become vertically polarized uh, as, a, as a general rule. Uh, but as I say, they're, they're largely insensitive in an indoor environment to that. Um, you know, something else to talk about is antenna gain. Uh, and as I said before, that is really just a measure of how focused the beam is. So um, if you're going to uh, focus energy in one direction, that means you're not going to be sending it in the other directions. I, uh, I really like the kind of the visual of taking a balloon and squeezing it. And you're not going to really change the total volume of the balloon like an antenna doesn't change the total amount of energy, but you are going to sort of change which direction it bulges out in. So that's something to, to keep in mind is they don't make power, they focus it. Uh, and final thing on this page, attenuation. Um, really, that's just the decay of the signal as it travels uh, either through the air or, you know, for our indoor um, implementations usually that's going to be through a wall um, and you know a, a typical wall may drop three five ten db uh, in a perfect world uh, before doing or as part of a site survey before doing a design you would go and measure um, the wall attenuations but something that really does not frequently happen and echo how and the other uh, planning programs will have uh, tables with different wall materials and uh, approximate attenuations for those that you can use uh, in a design. Um, you know, talking about the different antenna types, first up, omnidirectional antennas, and those are just antennas that radiate in, in all directions. And usually that means all directions in the horizontal plane. Uh, so they focus some of the energy that in an isotropic antenna, an antenna that radiates in all directions would be going up or down and, and focus it to the sides. Uh, typically, those are gonna have uh, a donut shaped um, pattern, something like this with the antenna running vertically through the center of that donut. And that would be a, a simple low gain omni antenna like a, a dipole. Uh, as you get higher and higher gain, the donut gets squished more from the top and the bottom, and it tends to get a little spiky with uh, some nulls uh, and some uh, more concentrated areas, but overall focused more out to the side. Um, important things to remember about omnidirectional antennas is they really want to be in free space. They do not perform well when they're slammed up against walls or you know, particularly conductive metallic things. So you want to try to get those in free space as much as possible. And since they're omnidirectional, you know, you try for uh, center of the uh, of the area. Our big don't here is regarding antennas with integrated access points. Uh, typically, those are designed so that they radiate out and down. Uh, if the access point is mounted on the ceiling, not like the uh, one dangling here in the picture. So check the antenna patterns that the manufacturers publish with the integrated antennas, but most typically they want to be mounted horizontally uh, on the ceiling or, or even on top of a bookcase or, or something like that, but not vertically on a wall. 
once again, check the uh, check the manufacturer's uh, diagrams for the antenna patterns uh, if you're unsure. Um, you know, those were the integrated antennas, typically very low grain, uh, low gain. Um, what I tend to call the blob antenna pattern, uh, but really is technically called a semi-hemispherical, that is the out and down. Um, but, and they're great for office environments, but for more specialized environments, sometimes you want to add an external antenna um, either because you want more gain and more range uh, or because you have aesthetic uh, considerations, uh, which something like our little dome or blister antenna down in the bottom uh, represents where you can hide the access point and move the, uh, the antenna only out into the uh, area where the users are. And of course we have the big stick, uh, Linears or, or dipole arrays, which are really just a number of small dipole antennas stacked up one on top of each other, focusing that pattern more out to the side. Um, and you know, the the higher the the gain of the antenna, remember that pattern gets flatter and flatter. And as you get over 10 or 12 dB, that that pattern gets so thin that um, you really have to pay attention to things like antenna heights uh, of both the transmitting and receiving stations. So we don't see a lot of those in indoors. Usually the big omnis are going to be on top of a mast uh, outside or, or something like that. Um, but do remember, all of these omnis want some clear space around them. Uh, this weekend, I was in a brand new, I mean, they were still cleaning the construction dust uh, warehouse, a major multinational, latest and greatest everything. And they were using these dome type antennas. They were four by four MIMOs, so they had multiple cables, but they had buried them up inside of the uh, metal joists uh, in the roof. So you know, they would have probably been better off with the integrated antennas uh, just mounted on the bottom with more of that downward pattern than they were uh, burying those antennas up inside of the ceiling structure uh, in this, this large, it was probably 300,000 square foot warehouse. So, um, yeah, people are still kind of doing it wrong. Uh, even, you know, huge companies that, that can absolutely afford site surveys and designs, they're still getting it getting it wrong uh, on these omnis um you know our next big category gonna be directional antennas and yeah, it's kind of anything that, that isn't an omnidirectional it tends to focus the the energy in one direction instead of uh, in all the horizontal directions uh, and, and within directional antennas there's a, a wide variety of uh, patterns and gains available uh, the simple, small, and wonderfully cheap antennas that we'll see so much of, a patch antenna, those are the very thin kind of wafers. And that'll be uh, generally a circuit board with the antenna pattern etched uh, into it. So they are, like I said, very inexpensive um, and uh, very discreet. So super popular. Uh, next up are panels. and. There's not a hard, fast line between a lot of these. A patch antenna is really about its construction. Uh, panel antennas, you know, they tend to be larger. They're going to have either an array of patches inside of them to shape that pattern, or they're going to have maybe dipoles in front of a reflector or something like that. But those are, are your, tend to be your larger antennas with um, kind of a more defined pattern. Um, and then sector antennas, this isn't really defined by their construction at all. They're usually going to be patch or panel antennas, but they're defined by the shape of their beam. Uh, and essentially, sector antennas are going to have narrow vertical patterns and wide horizontal patterns. So it covers sort of everything in front of them, 
uh, but nothing above and below them. Uh, you see, though, those are the big panels you'll see on cell towers. They'll have arrays of those pointing in different directions. Um, I'm a really a big fan of sector antennas for coverage. Um, they're great to mount on the wall and, and cover kind of the area in front of them. And, and remember, a sector antenna could be a, a patch antenna. They can be really, you know, quite small, particularly at five gigahertz. Uh, or if you want a lot of gain, they, they can be uh, very large. So uh, just keep in mind that the terms are, are a little bit uh, mixed with, uh, you know, omnidirectional and sector really defined by the radiation pattern, patch and panel more by the construction of the antenna. Um, and then our next category, point-to-point -point antennas, it's really a more extreme directional. Uh, so instead of maybe trying to cover everything in front of them, they focus the beam down onto a very narrow uh, pencil, almost, uh, spotlight instead of floodlight. Uh, the two that you'll see the most are parabolics. Uh, in this case, it's a grid antenna instead of being solid. Uh, sometimes you'll see them solid as well. The grid antennas are great because they don't have a lot of uh, wind resistance. Uh, so you don't need the, uh, as much mounting uh, on those. The other that you'll see, and you don't see as many of these, are actually quite expensive to build, is the Yagi antenna. Uh, these are the ones that, that look like the, uh, kind of the backbone of a fish. Uh, and frequently they'll be enclosed in a circular or oval uh, dome to protect the antenna. Um, so both of those tend to be very high gain, focus the beam in one direction, typically used for point-to-point -point type connections. Um, you know, some other considerations. Um, you know, we talk about antenna uh, gain versus uh, transmit power. Uh, and the big thing to remember is that turning up the power on an access point turns up half of the link. It turns up the access point to the client, but it does nothing for the client to the access point side. Antennas help on both sides. So they, they increase the receive sensitivity as much as they increase the transmit power, which is you know one of the reasons that uh, antenna gain is, is kind of a better way to go frequently than just turning up the power on antennas. Um, and our, our last one here, the 3 dB rule, every 3 dB of antenna gain is like doubling the power on the access point. It isn't stated here, but every 6 dB of gain doubles the range. And that's on either side. That can be 6 dB of gain on the uh, access point or 6 dB of gain on the uh, client side. It could be 3 dB of gain uh, on each. Both of those will be 6 dB of gain and double the range. So uh, that's important to remember. And you can't always, matter of fact, frequently can't do much for the uh, antenna on the client side. Sometimes you can, um, you know, forklift mounted, devices, you could uh, mount an antenna array on the top of the forklift, those kind of things where you could put some larger antennas on those. Um, we talked about this a little bit, going too far with, with high gain antennas. Um, and really there, there's sort of two going too fars. Uh, one of those, as I mentioned, as you get to really high gains, the pattern gets very thin. So you can easily end up in a situation where uh, all of your energy is above your clients. Uh, so your clients actually have fairly poor uh, coverage, even though you have giant antennas in the ceiling, all the, all the power is in the ceiling. And also remember that, that high gain, especially on an omnidirectional antenna, uh, is going to improve the ability of the access points to hear interference as well. So if you have neighbors with a lot of Wi-Fi or other RF, uh, more gain on your antennas is going to increase 
uh, the access point's ability to hear those and to defer to it on the transmit side. So that can be a, a balancing uh, factor. Um, other thing is uh, the band of the antenna. This talks about 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. We have 6 gigahertz now. It looks like most of the, uh, the antennas are going to be super broadband. So they'll cover 5 and 6 gigahertz. Uh, and then the 2.4 side, usually there is a, a separate element in the antenna for 2.4 or for you know, 5 gig that, that radiates poorly on the other band. It's not matched to it, so it's almost like it's not even there. Um, but do keep in mind that, that some antennas are single band and, and some are dual band um, and uh, don't accidentally... Uh, think that you have one when you have the other. Um, and uh, we do have a little thing down at the bottom, focus on five gigahertz or now five and six uh, as your performance band and, and 2.4 for legacy and IoT. And we're seeing more and more of that um, where companies are just turning off 2.4 altogether for their corporate networks. They may leave it on for IoT uh, if they have older legacy devices, they may spin off an SSID specifically for those on, on 2.4. They may keep it open for their guest network. Uh, and in fact, not even put guests on 5 gig to, to try to move some of that traffic away from their, their corporate network, um, at least the corporate spectrum, uh, and get as much performance as they can. Uh, so we are seeing that. And I like that. I, I definitely like moving kind of the slower, the non-critical onto 2.4 and focusing on five gigahertz and six gigahertz for your performance uh, and get as much off of that that doesn't need the performance as you can. Um, and, you know, try to move the higher performance devices off of, of 2.4. Um, and our mobile eye product, uh, it, it shows it so clearly. Uh, and it, mobile eye, it tracks your roaming history. So we can see as you roam back and forth between 2.4 and 5 gig and measure the performance on each. Um, and, and it's usually quite dramatic when a client roams from 5 gig to 2.4, the throughput falls off. Usually the voice quality falls off as well. Um, and a lot of that is that 2.4 is just so busy. There's so much stuff on 2.4 uh, and it's so much more penetrating than five gig, you hear uh, much more distant neighbors. Um, you know, we talked a little bit in the beginning about uh, cable loss and connector loss. Um, I mean, really long antenna runs are, are basically just, just straight up bad. Um, it doesn't, it allows you to remotely position an antenna, which is great, sometimes very necessary, but it turns RF into heat. Uh, so uh, very much of it, definitely you're gonna, you're gonna uh, turn a lot of your very critical power into heat. Uh, thicker cables are lower loss as a general rule. And there is such a thing as counterfeit uh, antenna cable. Um, worked at, at another company. Uh, we were shipping antenna cables with uh, our product. And basically, you couldn't get RF out of the other end of those cables. Uh, they, they were losing almost all the power you put in them. And uh, they were branded times microwave, good quality cables. Uh, but we took a razor and cut one open and cut open a real times microwave cable. And it, it was very clearly not just an inexpensive cable, but a counterfeit cable. So, so those do exist uh, and something to watch out for if you're doing uh, long cable runs is that you buy good quality cables and that they are, they are the real deal because um, they, uh, they do nothing for you but, but turn signal into heat. A um, little bit here on antenna placement practices. Um, you know, we discussed omnidirectional antennas really like some free space around them. Um, directional antennas typically are okay with being backed up against something. 
Uh, but some of the things to consider aesthetics, uh, you know, nobody really wants big antennas hanging down in their nice new office. So, you know, you're frequently going to have to either locate the access points uh, in locations maybe you don't want to for best coverage, or you're going to have to use remote antennas. Um, and that may just be something you're stuck with doing. Uh, but do be aware that there are trade-offs. Uh, you know, if, if you're going to use a remotely mounted antenna, uh, that's going to be uh, cables that are going to be cable loss. Those are going to be extra connectors that are going to be lost. That's going to be more money. I typically have access points with external antennas cost a little bit more than the ones with internal uh, antennas. And cables and antennas aren't, aren't cheap. Um, so just be aware. Uh, if you've got aesthetic issues, that, that there are some trade-offs to those. Um, a typical ceiling mounted, and we've got our, you know, open areas that I've mentioned a couple of times down here. Um, but in an indoor environment, carpeted space, the internal antennas are usually quite good. They, they tend to be down and out on their pattern, which is exactly what you want for them. Uh, they're mounted on the ceiling so they can look down on a lot of clients. Um, remember, uh, line of sight is, is your friend. It's not as important indoors as it is on the outdoor links because you do have the, the reflections, um, multi-path, uh, which used to be bad and with MIMO is now good. Um, the other thing is high ceiling. So in a lot of industrial um environments or um warehousing that sort of thing we have very high ceilings uh and there's sometimes a tendency to go well it's a big building it's a high ceiling i've got to put you know big antennas up there to cover everything and in fact what you're doing is you're you're putting all the energy in the ceiling uh and not down at the floor so you know probably you don't want omnidirectionals mounted uh, very high above the floor. You probably don't want high gain antennas high above the floor. Um, in warehouses and manufacturing, a lot of times access points along a wall with directional antennas, sectors, uh, firing end of the build into the building is a better choice than omnis above. Uh, rarely can you get a whole building with, with, uh, sectors on the walls, but uh, they do allow you to put some down tilt on them so you can point them at the floor uh, and you can frequently mount them, you know, halfway up the wall instead of in the ceiling. So those are usually a good choice for industrial sites. Um, above the suspended ceiling, yeah, generally a terrible idea. Uh, we've got a little picture of an access point up here buried among the uh, beams and the conduits, and uh, they just don't have good line of sight. Um, all of that metal near the antenna can actually change the, the radiation pattern and the resonance of the antenna a little bit. So uh, really a bad, bad place is, is just laying them on top of a ceiling tile or mounting them up in the, um, you know, up amongst the uh, ducts and the pipes. Uh, much better to mount them below a suspended ceiling um, or to use one of those uh, small bubble type remote antennas below the ceiling if you can't mount the whole AP. Um, other thing, electromagnetic interference. Um, we, we talk here about electric motors and power trays and things. That I've never really seen a lot of issue from electric motors, even those on um, variable frequency drives. Um, what I have seen a lot of interference from are presence detectors, uh, the, the kind of things that either, you know, are alarms or turn out the lights when nobody's in the room. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've seen a bunch of those, at least I think that's what they are, uh, based on, uh, spectrum charts, uh, in the five gigahertz ISM band, that's 149 through 165. Uh, they just, they're continuously on, it's a narrow band signal and it just wipes out the channels. So, uh, 
those kind of devices, those, those presence detectors, uh, at least now, seem to be much more of an issue than, than other interferers. Uh, and of course, the largest interferer is, is almost always either yourself, your own access points, uh, or your neighbors. Um, I talked about metal objects a bit uh, in the ceiling. Um, they are uh, definitely not going to pass signal through them. They will uh, bounce the signal off. And if it's close to the access point, it can really change the pattern, sometimes in pretty unpredictable ways. Um, I did some testing um, many years ago at this point uh, where I did take antennas and you know, systematically uh, place them at different distances from uh, a metal wall and make uh, measurements on the pattern. Uh, and at 2-4, uh, I found you really wanted about 18 inches and, and two feet off uh, was, was better. Uh, and it's about half of that at, at five gigs. So, you know, you really want nine or 10 inches minimum and a foot uh, or even more is, is, really what you're looking for at five gig for a standoff between an omnidirectional antenna and a, and a metal object. Um, have a little more on metal objects here. Uh, and this, of course, uh, I'm not sure where that one came from, but the access point in a cage, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much not gonna work. Um, it, uh, metallic fencing, uh, chain link fence, uh, chicken wire, this kind of uh, this kind of stuff, uh, definitely is going to block a large proportion of the signal. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about two four planning before. I think uh, we'll probably skip over that, except for the don't. Uh, all the two point four radios, you know, you see that all the time. Is the two four radios are running on all the access points often at the same power levels as five gigahertz and there's just too much too much 2.4 um i would generally say if you can't turn off all of the 2.4 and you, and you actually won't service on a network that's really designed for five gigahertz you're going to be turning off at least every other 2.4 radio and, and maybe two out of three uh 2.4 radios to to kind of balance the coverage uh, you definitely want the five gigahertz to be a little hotter, a little stronger signal. Um, many clients will roam based on nothing but signal strength. Uh, so if you've got a very strong 2.4 signal in there, uh, the clients will tend to want to roam to it more. Not all drivers are going to do that. Uh, some have more sophisticated algorithms that understand that five gig is going to be better and that look at the QBSS values, the, the load on a channel or the access point uh, in their roaming decision, but not all. Uh, and they will definitely, some of them will definitely try to roam to two four if it has a good signal. Um, oversized cells, uh, oh, cell size in general. Um, you know, we talk a lot in the industry about coverage versus capacity. Uh, and certainly in a lot of carpeted spaces, capacity is, is king. You're going to have 30, 40, 50 users in a small area. You need enough access points there that are going to support Zoom calls and file transfers and everything that we do on a network. Uh, but that isn't the case everywhere. Um, you know, warehouses, there's, there's more access points in a lot of those than there are clients. Those are definitely coverage situations where you can run more power, you can run bigger antennas, you can run bigger cells. Um, but uh, in our little don't here, turning up the transmit power, it'll increase the cell size, but it's not gonna increase the, the capacity of the network. For that, smaller cells, more APs, very probably narrower channels. Um, and then, a few words on, on auto-tuning. Uh, the various manufacturers call it different things, radio resource management uh, in general. Um, and that's the access point uh, or the controller dynamically adjusting the channel and the power levels 
Uh, these algorithms, when they first came out, were, were pretty terrible. Um, they are getting radically better now. Uh, I've actually kind of observed that the automatic channel selection, automatic power level uh, for most of the manufacturers has gotten much better in the last year or two. I think uh, they must have done a lot of work on those algorithms because uh, they are improving. Um, but one of the things to keep in mind uh, is that whenever an access point channel changes, there's a high probability it's going to drop its clients and they're going to have to reassociate to uh, either that access point again or a, a different one. So you do want to put some constraints on that resource management and only allow it to change channels uh, on an infrequent basis, you know, one, two, three times a day and not every 10 minutes, uh, which we do see sometimes. So uh, yeah, don't, don't leave it on the out of the box configuration. That's usually way, way aggressive. Uh, and keep an eye on it, you know, make sure that it's not doing anything, anything dumb. Uh, we've seen controllers put every access point in a building on the same channel. Uh, so, you know, sometimes those algorithms do break uh, and it is something that you just need to, to be aware of and, and keep an eye on it. Um, a little bit about some other sources of interference uh, and cell bands. They don't overlap in terms of frequency, but it is possible for different signals to mix and produce a signal at a, uh, a product or a difference frequency. Uh, and that can happen with um, cellular antennas, especially whenever uh, there's in-building cellular deployed. The signal strengths are, are much stronger. You've got a lot more chances for the, those signals to beat against each other and, and produce a spurious signal in a Wi-Fi band. It's not common, but it can definitely happen. Um, the other thing, microwaves, they run in the 2.4 gigahertz band um, and can be extreme sources of interference, both the home type microwave oven and uh, in industrial facilities, sometimes we see uh, big industrial uh, microwave heaters that you know will heat the glue in plywood, for example. I know Georgia Pacific uh, had a had an issue with that. Their their uh, plywood heating microwaves were just knocking out the the two point four in the building. Um, antenna angles, uh, and this is something you'll see a lot on the home access points that have got you know, two, three, four, more sometimes now antennas sticking out the back and, you know, what direction do I point these in? Uh, and the general, uh, general cases, put them in the same direction, put them generally vertically, all uh, parallel to each other. Um, the same is going to apply if you're kind of building your own MIMO antennas, you're using a, a number of, uh, single element antennas uh, and ganging them together uh, on a three or four stream access point, uh, you want them pointed in the same direction. Uh, so, you know, don't take half of the antennas and point them one way and half and point them the other way. That does not work as well as you might think it does. Uh, for MIMO to really work well, uh, for beamforming to really work well, they, they all need to be uh, aligned. Um, Final thing on this page, painting the antennas. Um, generally okay. Uh, you may void your warranty, but you're probably not going to, uh, to damage anything with the exception being uh, metallic paints uh, or specifically conductive paints. Uh, those can, uh, it's almost like, you know, putting the antenna in a cage. So, uh, you know, just uh, be aware uh, and if it's going to paint the access point and not the, um, the antenna, then, uh, yeah, the manufacturer may void out your warranty on that. Uh, there are wraps, uh, like vinyl wraps that go in cars that you can wrap a, an access point with that does not have those, those issues. And those you can get in patterns. So you can get 
like brick wall pattern or uh, you know oak board pattern or something like that. Um, we talked about polarity a little bit before. Um, crossed polarity, horizontal and vertical, uh, definitely don't talk to each other. They need to be uh, the same. Um, outdoors, it really matters. Um, indoors, not so much because there's so much reflection going on that the polarization tends to be scrambled. Uh, and neither the access points nor the clients are super sensitive to polarization by design. Um, outdoor access points, uh, most manufacturers have an, an outdoor version. Uh, if not, you can certainly put them in waterproof enclosures. Uh, do be aware of heat management though. Those can, can turn into ovens and bake your access points. Uh, so something to be aware of. MIMO, finally. So, you know, when I first started, uh, deploying Wi-Fi, it was it was pre pre MIMO. It was a single stream. We did have diversity, so there was a second antenna, and the the access point could decide which one to use. That helped some, but at the time, multi point was just a disaster. You get into a very reflective building, and sometimes Wi-Fi would not work at all. Uh, MIMO uses multiple antennas some very sophisticated math that I don't understand very well uh, to combine those multiple antennas and uh, improve the performance and really take advantage of those reflections. So they get different reflections with, uh, with slightly different timing on them. Uh, and that allows them to reconstruct the, uh, the signal, as I say, better than, uh, or in using math that I, truly really don't understand. Um, beam forming, it's another thing that you can do with multiple antennas where you will uh, feed them with uh, out of phase signals and use that to kind of steer the beam. Um, and that's certainly something that, that some access points will do as well. And that'll be a feature on there, but uh, it can work very well, especially uh, with MU MIMO where uh, it can transmit uh, to multiple clients in the same direction at the same time. Um, coverage and capacity. You know, we, we talked about this several times, um, but in some environments, it's, it's really capacity. Uh, I know access point vendors really want to sell you on capacity. Uh, and in an office environment, that's usually the driving factor where you'll want dense AP deployments, lower power, typically lower gain antennas or the internal antennas, and typically narrower channels running on 20 or 40 megahertz channels instead of 80 megahertz channels. <clears throat> Each individual client will receive less throughput, but as an aggregate, they tend to do better. Um, and uh, down at the bottom, lower data rates. Um, this actually is, is something quite important. Um, and it helps several things. Um, you know, they say low speed clients eroding bandwidth here. And that is one of the things. If you have a lot of traffic at lower data rates, um, you know, that traffic takes longer to transmit. It's on the air longer than the same amount of data at a higher data rate. So lower data rate traffic uses an outside amount of channel utilization. Um, so those lower data rates can be bad that way. And we tend to disable the lowest data rates on an access point uh, to partially prevent that. It also will tend to encourage clients to roam faster if the lower data rates aren't available for them to move to. Um, and it will reduce the channel utilization, the, all of the management traffic, the, the beacons, the probe responses, all of that um, is gonna happen at the lowest mandatory data rate. Um, and by moving those up, you move the, all of that management traffic to uh, higher data rates. Not a big deal in low density environments, but if you get into lecture halls or sporting venues or anything like that, entertainment venues where you have 
hundreds and thousands of clients essentially in a room, just the probes and probe responses from all of those clients looking for an AP to attach to can amount to substantial. I've seen channel utilization just from probe responses over 50% in, uh, in some sporting venues and some airports where all the clients are sending out, won't some access point talk to me? And they send that out at the lowest data rate for the phi. So one meg on 2.4, six meg on five gig. Um, and that trend travels a long way. And every access point that hears it is going to respond. Uh, so that can really drive channel utilization, uh, having those low data rates enabled, especially in big environments. Um, site surveys, RF planning, yeah, it's, it's really critical to do actual designs. Um, ideally on site, you know, a AP on a stick or a shoe leather, I've heard called surveys where you do go out with a test equipment and you measure the building. Those are, those are gonna be the best. Um, and the data that you receive on that, you know, how much attenuation are in the walls, that sort of thing can be fed into a planning program uh, to help produce uh, better results. Uh, final thing, little seven signal plug, continuous monitoring. RF environments are super dynamic. There's always change going on. Um, it's really hard to tell what's going on without specific monitoring. The, the access points, the controllers monitor themselves, but frankly, they don't do a great job of it. Uh, and some kind of external monitoring is, is super helpful. And I think that is it. Uh, Heather, I will turn this back over to you. Very good. All right. So very full session today. So we don't have too much time for Q&A. And I want to make sure Eric still has a couple of minutes. So Sorry. On... no, you're you're totally fine. Um, let's see. Um, could you please explain the AP on a stick that was mentioned? Um, anonymous attendee has not used that before. Yeah. Um, and really AP on a stick, um, it describes a site survey where you take an access point out, you temporarily mount it and you test based on that access point position. It's called AP on a stick. Because a typical way to do that is to take some sort of a stand that you can put the AP on and elevate it up into the air, as opposed to actually strapping it into the ceiling. So it becomes an AP on a stick. I will sometimes call the same thing a shoe leather AP because you spend a lot of time walking. Although I think Keith Parsons uses a Segway. <laughs> he would. Um, Sounds like a good idea to me. I've been yeah. certainly pretty tuckered out doing uh, site surveys. Just got to be careful. Um, let's see. Forrest sent a couple over here. So let's take, um, let's take this one. Are there antenna designs that can attenuate certain frequencies like a notch filter? I don't know that there are antenna designs that can do that they they typically are you know designed for a band um but there are absolutely third-party notch filters that you can put between the antenna and the access point so yeah